<laughs> Mike was an NBC correspondent for more than 30 years, and he was a regular contributor to the Today Show. For the past seven plus years, he's been a documentary filmmaker working out of his home in Chicago that's since leaving NBC. Mike's projects include, as a documentarian, include Catholicism, a 10-part series with Father Richard Barron, who is now a bishop in Los Angeles, and also In Common, a public television series based on the idea that we have more in common as humans than we might otherwise think. And on top of all that, Mike is a vital member of the PC alumni community. We'll talk more later about his work around the college's 2017 centennial and his projects with athletics, especially hockey, and, and much more with regard to his contributions as a, a loyal and valued Providence College alum. But let's say hello to Mike and check in on how things are going in Chicago. Hi, Mike. Hi, Joe. How are you? Things are fine. I mean, the family, I don't see them. We have four kids and nine grandkids all within 20 minutes, but we they come over sometimes. We talk through the glass door on our porch and in, in, in the front. It's like a prison exchange, you know, basically. But it's um, it's what we can do. We don't, um, you know, we're like everybody else. We have to be careful. By the way, mentioning your children, we should say you've got a bunch of Providence College alumni in that group, too. <laughs> all four. That's right. Generations, so. And they're also professional collaborators uh, to varying extents, which is another really interesting subject that we'll get into as we work our th way through the next hour or so. So we invited our friends to join us today to get your perspectives on overcoming adversity, something that's been a subject of countless numbers of your stories over the course of your career. When you look at it from the perspective of a storyteller, what is it about that subject, about overcoming long odds that helps to make something a good and compelling story. Well, I think it's just, it's so universal. It happens to everybody. And that's the best part of a story is if you can make it universal. You know, if you tell a sports story, you have to, I would like to make it so everybody would, uh, you know, understand it, even if they didn't like sports. But everybody's had adversity. Everybody's had something happen to them. That's the human condition from the very beginning. You know, it's the, the whole thing about what, doesn't kill you makes you stronger and that's since the beginning and so i think uh, adversity happens uh, we have to deal with it and it makes us better you know it's like if you had a, a hut made out of hay or something and kept it kept being blown down by the wind and you'd try to make one out of stone but you wouldn't know how to put the stone up there and that leads to engineering and you know all that kind of stuff so it's just part of our life and, it, and i think that um, part of us would like to say we'd, we'd want to put it away but it really, in a sense, we don't wish things like this that is, that is happening to us now. But in so many cases, the adversity is, is what makes us better. And there are certain times when you have to seek it. And when we talk about stories, we want our audience to feel something too, right? right. So that can be tension. It's right. a bit of a good story, but it can also be the good feeling that comes when we hear about yeah. somebody who's overcome something. Yeah, and identify with it. And I think there are you know, lots of stories of adversity that are epic stories of adversity. And in my career, there have been a few that have been on that epic scale, but most have been on the everyday scale because the things that we all can relate to and um, it happens every day to us where we're a setback, a job lost, or you don't get into the school you want to, or your child doesn't, they, they don't make a team. Now what? Now what do you do? And it's always that that solution uh, area that we have to go to is now what do you do? And out of the now what comes some of the, the greatest things you can do. Um, you wouldn't have chosen them, but um, if, if you have the idea and the ability to, you know, think about it, you, you take the blow, you know, like I say, I, I used to box and you take a blow and if you panic, you're gonna take many more of those. You have to go, now what? How do I block the next one? And how do I get past that? And it's instantaneous. And I try to um, myself is when things happen as you, you know, you're for a second, you feel that pain or more than a second, but then try to get right back onto it and, and say, well, what do I do now? And I think, um, you know, we all understand that it's a human condition. I've been a fan of your work for some 40 years now. And one of the things that strikes me about the way you tell a story is that you you tell it through the eyes of a person. Stories are about people, right? The, the mm -hmm. good stories. And you're always able to, to get to the heart of what a person is thinking and to get them to express that. Is that 
in the context of this subject, someone who's overcome adversity, is that more difficult or is that easier or, or how does that sort of fit on that continuum? Well, with me, it's, it's um, somewhat easy uh, because you have to come across, or I try to come across as someone who understands. And I, I, don't, I don't enter into an interview as the, the person who was, who was driving for an answer. I, I, I want them to know that I know uh, that I have, and sometimes before we even turn on the camera, uh, I will try to tell a story about myself, about a failure that I've had or whatever. So they understand that I'm not there to use them uh, to go. And also sometimes you don't want to, is to glorify them too much because people are embarrassed about that. You know, I, I tell stories before where I did a story, um, uh, I do a story every year on the rock, where the, or I did, where the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree came from. It comes from a people people's yards. And one year it was from a fireman, a New York City fireman in Rockefeller Center finds it by helicopter and he lived in a little house north of the city. And um, so I wanted to go to the firehouse, but all those firemen who were first responders don't want to be painted as heroes. They're, they're firemen. So in, in the case there, I made sure that this guy was middle-aged, but when I went into the firehouse, I made sure that I interviewed the oldest fireman there, the veteran. Because this young fireman, after I left, people would have ribbed him about, oh, you're a hero now, and all the rest. But they're not going to rib him if I also did the top guy, right? And then you deal with it, and you don't try to make everybody, uh, they don't want to be made into epic, epic heroes. I, should I introduce this, um, the story about Silas? Perfect. I'd like to mention to, a quick thing to our, our friends who are with us tonight. If you would like to engage in the conversation, we'd love to hear from you, by the way. Uh, and we'd like to have you send in your questions or observations in the chat window, and we'll share them with Mike as we go along. Mike has been good enough to pull out a few clips from his career, so we'll share some video. And let's start with that, Mike, and tell us a little bit about who Silas Purnell was. Well, one of the things about my job is I tried to really avoid using finding stories that have already been reported on. So, um, I mean, occasionally you, you would, but most times I, they came to me through different odds. And I was, in, um, I was at the University of Iowa one time doing a story and I was interviewing the president of the college and he, and he said, you're from Chicago. I said, yeah. He said, you must know Silas Purnell. I said, I don't know Silas Purnell. Purnell, who is he? He said, he's amazing. He's put so many kids into our college. He's, um, uh, he, he's a guy who is a placement officer, basically, college placement. And he said he works in, in the inner city and, and uh, most and all these kids are from those neighborhoods that you don't expect a lot of success coming from. So I, I came back to Chicago. I, I found him. He hadn't been profiled by anybody. It ended up that he, uh, before he retired, and he's, he died a while ago, that they estimated he put, he got four, I think it was, 40,000 kids in the college, more than anybody in the history of college placement. And most of those kids didn't have what the colleges thought they needed to get into college. So here's a clip, if we want to run it in a second, this is just a short part of the story I did on Silas, but it's one of those situations where we, when, you know, we, we love it when people get passionate in their answers. And what Silas says is, is so great. And I never forgot him and, uh, and actually would go back to see him after I did the story. And every Friday he would go to this little restaurant and have catfish for lunch. And I, would jo I joined him a number of times for that. Um, so watch this clip anyway. His files are filled with stories of people who simply weren't supposed to make it off these streets. Take, for example, the case of one young woman who scored only a four out of a possible 36 on a college placement exam. Her improbable dream was to go to the University of Illinois, and she came to Silas Purnell for help. I said, but your level of preparation don't match what they want for you to be admitted to the University of Illinois. She said, Mr. Purnell, you know about my level of preparation, but you don't know about my level of desperation. I'm in the street already. I can't go nowhere but up. He twisted some arms, got her accepted, and she graduated in four years. Are we ready for you? The colleges underwrite the scholarships, but it's Silas and his friends who scrape together money for books, clothes, meals, and plane tickets, although never the round trip variety. No, don't ever waste your money giving the student a round trip ticket because he'd be itching to use that other half. Ship him out one way and pray for him. 
<laughs> Words to live. I just by. love. I just love that thing. In fact, I use that all the time around the house where something would happen. We'd go ship them out one way, you know. <laughs> but you know, and I want to also talk about the fact that adversity is often you know viewed as something that's horrible or bad. And I mentioned a little bit earlier about seeking adversity. And uh, there's a story about my son when he was in high school. Brendan was kind of like me. He was struggling in academics, but but he could do more. He was a, basically a C student, but extremely creative. In his first two years of high school, he was at a bigger high school, and um, I know he could get his Cs, and I don't, didn't really care much about that, but he wouldn't have played a sport. If he played sophomore baseball, he wouldn't have made anything after that. And because he was so creative, and, and, and failure is such a big part of creativity, and if you're afraid to fail, you'll, you'll not reach that creative state. And he was a very creative kid, so I thought, I don't know. And I found a small school nearby. I went there by, you know, somebody asked me to do a favor. And it was perfect. It was a small prep school, you know, not a boarding school. You had to play a sport. You had to have a line and speak, in a speaking line and a play. He was a good enough athlete. He would have been played there. But he would have been played football and baseball. But I knew he didn't practice baseball much. And he could throw the ball really hard. And I know what would happen to him. He'd, 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 everybody would go, wow, we got this great kid. He's 6'4". He can throw the ball really fast. But Brendan wasn't practicing, so I knew what was going to happen. He'd get on the mound, and he would fail. And I thought, that's exactly what he needs. He needs to fail. So he didn't want to go, um, but he went, and that happened. He didn't practice. He came out on the baseball field thinking he could do it, and he never got past the first inning. He'd walk people and hit them and all the rest. And the coach finally said, you're not pitching anymore. And Brendan was sort of crushed by that. And it's hard to watch as a parent. It really is. But, you know, and there's a fine line. You don't want someone to sink too low. But he ended up playing third base. He did okay. And the next year before baseball or the next summer, he practiced all the time. And he got better. And he was their best pitcher the next year. And then he ended up getting a cable or not a cable. He got a, a TV show on ABC Family when he was 19. I don't think that ever would have happened had, he, had I not put him in this position where he would fail under conditions that he wouldn't be crushed, right? But he'd learned the lesson that, first of all, failure isn't that bad if you try hard. If you don't try hard, you should examine yourself. It's not going to kill you. It should make you stronger. And there's another thing that I did was when I was a reporter at NBC, if I was covering a big situation, the Olympics or Super Bowls or conventions, I would purposely go there without a story in, in mind. No story, zero. And I'd get there maybe a day or two before I got a camera crew. So now you have the desperation. You go, I have to find a story. But that puts you in hunter mode, right? And I'm looking around at everything because obviously there are stories there. There are human beings. There's stories. And all, most of the other reporters bring a bunch of stories with them. And that's why they all do similar stories. So I would look there and I'd find, them and do a, and find a story that was different. And I'd do it. And, um, you know, you have to have that desperation to find it. And I would do the story and it would air and all the other reporters there, the big name people that everybody's heard of would come up to me and say, how did you find that story? And I go, it's here. It was right here. But if you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. So that's an adversity that I put on myself because I knew the answer would be a better story and a unique story. But you have to go in there and scared and, and you're scared of what if I don't find a story? And that leads to this other statement that somebody reminded me of this uh, condition they called the universe of abundance, that all the answers are out there. The universe has every answer and it does. We're not going to find them all. But if you know that the answer is there, you can seek it. And I knew that there was a story there. So I just put my you know, binocular eyes on and listened closely and found a story. You know, the example of Silas Purnell and the story you told about Brendan Mm -hmm. And your role in, in, help, in helping him find his way to working through his disappointment, that points out this notion that we think about the person who has overcome long odds, but so often there's somebody who's making that happen or helping to make it happen. And yeah. those people are equally as inspiring, aren't they? Yeah, it is. And, but, you know, it's difficult because there is a fine line. You know, and, and as a parent, you want your child to like you, right? And, and as a parent, you want to see your child su succeed. Or as a coach, you know, you want them to respect you. But you're going to have to do things sometimes that are going to push them. And they're not going to like you that day. 
And, but what's best for them really in the end. And you would hope that you're honest with yourself and saying, I don't need the glory of my son being quote perfect because he's not. Um, I need him to be secure. I need him to be confident. I need him to know that he's going to stumble and he, he'll know how to get back up. But I think, you know, how they do all the, beyond the helicopter parent now, there's this other term and other terms. But I think, you know, like I say, it's, I think because I know, because I stumbled so many times and I had such a long road up that I think, thank God I did because I, I, I learned some lessons here. And, you know, I did a thousand stories at NBC too on regular people who have also figured a way out. And you go, I'd be a fool if I didn't listen to a thousand lessons over that 32 years. Great segue, because I'd like us to talk now about your story because it fits into this same category. So take us to the late 1970s, you and your wife, Kathy, and two of your children living in Arizona. Right. Children, you've got a dream. You've got something you want to pursue and very long odds in front of you, but, but you did it. How did, you, how did this all come about? Well, I have to give a Cliff Notes version of right before that, because I was a struggling student through grammar school and high school, basically C's and D's. I didn't know why. It turns out I was dyslexic. They didn't test, test for that back then. So anyway, I was wondering, I didn't have a voice. I, I was afraid to raise my hand and all that stuff. And I went with my brother to a concert, an outdoor concert in the summer one night. And it was a sort of a minor concert because it was a folk singer we hadn't quite heard of. And I just went out of curiosity and I listened to this folk singer and like, wow, because I couldn't, I didn't know why I couldn't read well, but I couldn't read well, but I could hear well. And I could hear the poetry. Well, it was a young Bob Dylan and before he was real famous. And I, that night I said to myself, that's it, I'm going to be creative because I was so blown away by the creativity that I, I thought I'm going to be that. And so in a sense, I built a home in, in my mind that I'm going to be creative. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be something out there. So I go to, you know, to PC, um, I buy a movie camera, you know, because I'm, I still don't know if I'm a writer. And I start making movies, Super 8 movies, get married in 1970. We have a child a year later. I try out for a professional hockey team. I don't make it. I work for the hockey team a little bit, low wages stuff, keep taking movies, had a job as a title examiner which is, you know, I was, I, the, the ho professional hockey team had me practice with them uh, because I could play, but they needed one more player for practice. And this job let me do that because I could go to the job early, leave, and then come back. But it was, it was like three fifty a month and it was real boring. And I, <laughs> one time after I was there a couple of years, cause I was a hard worker, but I, I hated the job and I didn't want to be that cause I was going to be creative. And they called me into the office one day and I was, like I say, making three fifty dollars an hour. We had two kids now, and not three fifty dollars an hour, three fifty dollars a month. And the guys in the office say, Mike, congratulations, we're going to make you a title examiner and you're going to make $1,000 a month. And I didn't know this was happening. Immediately I had this thought, oh, geez, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't take it. I'm going to remove him. And I didn't know why I said it, but I, I think if I took it, there's no way I could have left it. And uh, not too long ago, I was telling that story around the house and Kathy goes, I never heard that. You, they were going to give you that money? You, you, I would have made you do that. But there's something in me in that, that home to get to. So eventually, I was now I'm 31. Um, um, another child, Carrie's born. A friend of mine who's a waiter said, had seen my home movies said, you should do TV. I thought, I don't know if I can do TV. I, I don't, like, you have to look a certain way and all the rest. So we went around the he went with me to the TV stations in Phoenix. And of course they all, I would put, I would show them my home movies on the wall and they're going, who, who let this guy in? And I had no experience and all the rest. And so um, they all rejected me and um, we were down, we were still looking. And one day um, then, no, and then Kathy gave birth to Carrie. So uh, I was with Matt, my friend who was a waiter and he's the guy who tells me I could do TV. Uh, and I go, I'm going to go see Kathy into the, in the hotel in the hospital. And I go in, and they say, okay, she's leaving tomorrow, but you have to pay us 500 bucks before she leaves. And I, I thought, I don't have $500. So I went out to Matt and I said, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like, are they gonna hold my baby and my wife hostage for 500 bucks? So um, I, I said goodbye, I, I went back, I said goodbye to Matt and I went back to see Kathy. And then I came home that night and it was dark and I went to our mailbox and there was an envelope in the mailbox with no stamp and it was 
I opened it and it was $500 and it was from my friend, Matt, who went out and borrowed that $500 in the few hours I, after I left him. And so anyway, um, my last stop after getting rejected at all the stations was at the public television station. And, you know, I, I was hoping that what they'd see is this ambitious person making home movies and they'd hire me and teach me how to do TV. But the, the news director goes, what if I just give you a cameraman for a day? You just go out and do a story. Let me see if I like it. And I go, okay. And I'm riding home. I go, driving home. I go, I don't know how to do a story. How do you do a story? And so I think a lot of people would have said, I'm not ready for that. But I did a story. He liked it. I don't know how I did it, but he liked it. And he said, we want to hire you. Can you do two a, two a week for us? Which, as you know, is a full-time job. I said, yeah. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in TV. I'm out of debt we can, because TV people make money. He said, we don't have a budget. Uh, we, you, you, we have a stamp fund, you know, petty cash. Usually there's 20, 30 bucks left at the end of the week or month, you can have it. And so what do you do? You say no. And I had to say, and I didn't have to say no, but I had to say yes, or I did say yes. And, um, and so I worked there for four months and then went to the CBS affiliate um, in town. Now I had something to show them and I showed them and, and the, I know the news director looked at me and he said, well, this is interesting, but I don't think you could ever have a job on camera because you don't look right. And my nose had been broken so many times from hockey that I didn't look right. But he then said, but we'll, we'll give you a, try, a shot. You can be a part-timer here. And, and I did these stories and people liked them and, and I rose that fast. And I realized what, what was as I wasn't perfect. I stumbled a bit. I can't read too well, you know, teleprompter, but, but I'll just be me. You know, I'll just be that guy. I'll cover everyday people like me. So that restriction that I had actually didn't take me off the air. I had my nose, uh, ear, nose, and throat guy straightened it, but I, I, I never felt like, you know, too far above the fray, basically. So I think those limitations really helped me tell stories about everyday people. And I worked there for the CBS station. They did sports for a year and a half. And somebody from NBC was in a hotel room one night and saw a story I, I did. It was a year and a half later. And they flew me to New York and they hired me on the Today Show. And, and soon after, they said, you can do any story you want anywhere in the world. Just do it. And I did that for 32 years. So it was pretty, pretty nuts. But. That's a, a one in a million circumstance because it's a one in a million talent. That's the reason that happened. By the way, you should mention, or we should mention, who that NBC executive was. It was Richard, Richard Salon, who had been a CBS executive. CBS president. Of C he was the president of CBS News during the Cronkite years, and you know, hired, you know, Roger Mudd and 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 all these people, you know, um, Peralt. And he was, he had retired from CBS. They have a mandatory 65 year old retirement and he went over to NBC. So he, he wasn't just a, a talent scout. He was a big wig. And when they flew me to New York, I, uh, I hadn't watched the Today Show much. Or we have kids, I can't watch show, TV in the morning. And they, they bring me into the Today Show office and Tom Brokaw's there and the producers and, and he's going, what do you think of the show? I'm going, uh, good, I guess, you know, and, I thought, it, I thought the interview went, went poorly, but they ended up hiring me and said I could live anywhere. So my wife and I um, decided to go back to Chicago where we both uh, spent our childhood. And so, so I could go anywhere from Chicago. It was easier. Plus, I didn't have to be in New York and be under the noses of the bosses there. Good thinking. <laughs> so that was a, a legend, a pioneer in, in yeah, broadcast. Was. Uh, was. Broadcast news, television news for sure. And my By first way, boss, Steve Friedman, uh, on the Today Show was, was really good because he had the courage to say, do your own story, you know, do it. And um, interesting thing that, that I'll throw in there because the first three or four or five stories I did at NBC, um, I got a lot of feedback. Oh, great story, great story. I was new, I was different and all the rest. Maybe the sixth story, I was walking into the, through the bureau in Chicago and the bureau chief was walking by and I had a story that was on that day. And I go, hey, Rod, he goes, hey, Mike, and he hadn't said anything about my story. And so I started thinking, wow, maybe he didn't like my story. Maybe I went too far. Maybe I, maybe I, I shouldn't have been trying to be that creative. And by the time I got to my desk, I thought, what, am I, what are you doing to yourself? You know, he probably didn't even see the show. And, and now you're editing yourself. So I ended up calling my boss in New York. And I said, I have a request. Don't ever tell me if you really like my story. 
only tell me if you don't like it. Because I didn't want to go through that again, where I started thinking, well, I didn't hear anything. So if I heard nothing, I'd be okay. And, and a lot of times people don't want to do that because a pat on the back is nice. And I like that too. But I thought it, it started to, to feel creatively destructive to me to, to seek you know, the pat on the back. Just try to, I wanted to know, yeah, that was, that was a pretty good story. Or I knew if it, if it wasn't that good either. But he, you know, so he did. And, and I, I went with, for a long time without hearing much from anybody in New York. By the way, that first story for public television in Phoenix, what, what was the story? Can't remember. No, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I asked the guy there, the people, I said, could you save this tape? Because I didn't know if, if I'd last three months or one month or what was a TV story. And they erased it. And so, um, because remember back then, tape was a commodity. And, and they, they have these big bulky tapes and they just erase them and use them again. NBC erased the moon landing. Do you think we need this? I don't know. We needed the tape. And they had to buy the moon landing from somebody else. <laughs> Frugality, that's important. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're operating a business. You were an innovator in broadcast journalism, Mike. You became the first network correspondent to find, shoot, report, and edit stories all by yourself. And incidentally, this is pretty common now, especially in right. local news. Why did you want to do it that way? And what were the advantages and, and disadvantages? Well, I learned to do, since I was shooting my own home movies, I learned a little bit about how to be a cameraman. And then when I was in Phoenix, uh, I could edit. And I learned how to edit with the old machines. And I, w I liked it because I could do it when I wanted to do it. And, and being a father uh, of kids who are now getting, you know, playing sports and, and all that kind of stuff, I, I would edit a story in the bureau and I'd say, can I get an editor for Wednesday? And they said, no, we, we have one on Thursday. And I go, oh man, Thursday, is my, my, my daughter has a basketball game and I have to miss it. So I thought if I could edit myself, I could edit in the morning, I could get up at five and what can do it. But it was against the, the law. I mean, the union laws there. And I'm not anti-union at all. I'm pro-union. I was in a union. But when I was in Korea during the Olympics, it was a, it was a different union setup. And one day I, I was working for Bob Costas' show and I had, a, um, I had a piece due, but there were no editors available, but they had editing machines there. So I asked the editor, I said, do you mind if I do this? They said, no. And I did it. And I go, this is the answer. And so I, my contract was up and I went, my agent, which I had now have an agent, and I, I, that was the demand. And everybody said, no, no, we don't do that. And um, I had some leverage because I was, I, they liked me. And so I held out and I got the, the permission to be like an outside company, Leonard Productions. They pay me every two weeks. But I, and so I bought all this equipment, got a little office, a couple blocks from my house, hired my brother as a sound man, a friend as a cameraman, had our own crew and I would edit my own stuff and I could see my kids' games and I could do a, a job. And then as the equipment got smaller and smaller, it was easier and pretty soon it was just me. And I would go out to these stories. And what happens is if you're talking to somebody who's never been on the air and there's three strangers there, you know, one with a boom mic, lights, camera person, it, it's pretty intimidating to them. But when they see just little old me with a, and I had a small camera and, I'd, and the, the mic on top of the camera would be close to them, they were way more open. They were disappointed sometimes when I, because they'd think, oh, the show's coming. And then I'd show up and, with a little backpack and they go, you're the Today Show? But it was always better, it, it, the, the material was better. And nothing against any of the great camera people I worked with, but that was just my style. And, and, and they, you know, they applauded me for it. So I, you know, I, may, I do it a lot and I still do it. So I, I enjoy it. And I make a lot, still make a lot of home movies too. We identify you mostly with the Today Show, but what were some of the other things that you did during your career at NBC? Well, I also worked for Nightly News, did stories for them. Uh, I did a couple for Dateline, but that was too much of a hassle and I stopped doing that. Um, I did Showtime, asked me to do uh, some boxing stuff and I did that. Um, public television I could do in my contract. So I did a couple public television documentaries. Um, I wrote a book when I was 56. I had taken a journey with my parents and got an offer to write a book. And you know, I'd never written a book, so I, I didn't know how to do it. And I had nine months to do it. And I wrote a book and it made the New York Times bestseller list. And it's so ironic to me because, um, like I say, being a troubled student and not knowing why and not thinking I was a writer, 
um, I, I didn't know I became a writer. And what, one of the reasons I, th I think I did, or I know I did now, is that when I went to PC, I, I wrote a letter to my girlfriend at the time who became my wife every day for four years. And, and it was like, a, this is what's happening. It's the Vietnam years. It's the hockey years. We're losing. We're winning. This is happening. I'm, I'm ticked off about this. I'm elated about that. And, you know, I think in retrospect, I was, I probably had a yearning to be a writer, but because I had such lousy grades in writing, I didn't think I was a writer. I thought you had to be graded. But the letters were were ringing true, and so if you write if you write every day for four years, that's pretty good practice. And you're writing about stuff that there's no I don't worry about punctuation or grammar or anything. I'm just going to pour my my heart out here, and so that it, I know that helped me. And then by the time I got into TV and you're writing a, a different type of thing, um, I was more confident by then about how to tell a story and all the rest. Let's return to that subject of overcoming adversity in the stories and uh, related to that. We can find good examples anywhere in the world of sports. We should note that you were a fine hockey player at PC and, as you mentioned, had a professional tryout after graduating. What did you learn from sports, especially when it comes to the overcoming long odds? Well, um, I, I didn't start playing hockey until I was 16. I, I used to be a baseball player and then I, my vision went bad. For some reason, I couldn't really track the ball. And so um, my dad said, why don't you just try, try to play hockey? And I was nearing my 16th birthday, I think. That's impossibly late to start to play hockey. I mean, unless you just want to play, you know, be a you know, rig rat. And so I, I, I didn't have any equipment. And they had, they had these, not trials, but it's a house league. So they all skate and then they grade you and everybody plays, but they try to balance the teams. I didn't have any equipment. So I went to a, um, a local, there was a rummage sale. And I bought what I thought was good hockey equipment but it was probably 1930s or 40s hockey equipment. So when I went there, I looked like it was Halloween, like I was dressing up like from another era, and I was. And it was embarrassing because I go, and I couldn't skate, and I couldn't do anything and drop the puck around. And, and I thought, I'm sick of being lousy. And so there was an outdoor rink not far from our house, and the, the winters were colder back then. And so they, they, it was in November, and I started getting up early in the morning and just skating at this rink with a puck and I couldn't shoot it because I wasn't, it was an outdoor rink, but I wasn't supposed to be on it. So instead of ripping away with, with the puck and shooting, which what everybody would want to do, I just skated, you know, and, and skated backwards and forwards and all the rest. And I got better. And I think in the th third game I played, I got three goals and I was on the all-star team in a month. So I knew I, and I could run fast. So I knew if I could learn to skate, I could be a, a fast skater. I'll probably never be a great skater, but I'll be a fast player and I will play hard. And um, then, you know, I had to repeat, repeat my senior year because my grades weren't great. And um, by the time I finished that one, I, I had ideas that maybe I could be a, a college hockey player, but no Chicago players had ever played division one of that era. So everybody's saying don't even try, but that, that, that's how I got into hockey. And then should I go on about how I got sure. into PC? So please do. So I didn't know where, where I could go. And I had already been rejected by PC the year before. Um, and so and my, and the reason I, I went to PC is my dad, who's from New Jersey, um, New Jersey, he's a Patterson, New Jersey kid, kind of a street urchin kind of kid. And there was somebody from his neighborhood who's older than him, who was a basketball player at Providence College named Kruger. And my dad said, wow, what a good guy he was. He was a great athlete, but what a nice guy. And so because this athlete came from PC and was a nice guy, which is really the point of, of a college or that what PC does so well is that you, you want to be a good athlete, a good student, but also a good person. That, that, that guy made an effect, my dad, who said, how about Providence College? So I applied, I didn't get in. I got rejected again. My dad called a, a Navy chaplain. In the Navy, you know, he was on a ship with who happened to be in Dominican. Can you help uh, my, my son? He made a phone call and I got a call from Father Begley, who was the athletic director at the time. And he said, we're going to let you in on probation, um, meaning if you got a D, you're out. And so that's how I got into PC. I never saw the place until I showed up freshman year. You know, uh, like I say, it was like a Bing Crosby movie. I was there like getting off out of a cab with a suitcase and a hockey bag and 
didn't know if I could make it, but I tried out and, and I, not only did I make it, we had freshman hockey back then because freshmen couldn't play varsity, but I was on the top line. I was the second leading scorer. And, and our, my coach was Lou Lamorello, who ends up being a you know, National Hockey League Hall of Famer, tough, tough person. But, and I tried hard. And so um, that, that first lesson of, hey, you can't get in college. Hey, you can't play hockey. And I did. Um, really reflected back when I was trying to get into TV and they say, you can't, look, you can't do TV. You're 31. You don't look right. But I'd already been through that. You know, I, I played that and playing for Lou and having these, these, these experiences. I mean, he was such a great coach and so tough and so many lessons that I learned. It was, it was terrific. On the subject of sports, let's go back to one of your clips and oh, yeah. we'll share one from a remarkable story, somewhat familiar to, to many people in that, is the story of former major league pitcher Jim Abbott. Yeah. So clip up for us if you would please. Yeah, I was um, I was at the Today Show and he was in college. He was a senior at Michigan. And um, I was uh, somebody said, "Hey, this guy's a good story." He was Jim Abbott was born without a right hand. And so all his life people were saying, we're trying to cushion the blow saying, "Well, Jim, you better not try out for little league because it'll be so disappointing if you don't play or all right, you play little league, you probably shouldn't play high school. It's going to be difficult." And this kid just wanted to play. And he learned how to manipulate the, the mitt. And he goes through high school. He goes to Michigan. He's a great pitcher at Michigan. He wins the Sullivan Award as the best amateur athlete um, in the country. And then he makes the Olympic team. Now, I think we did the story right before the Olympic team or not. I can't remember. But I sat in, a, in Flint, Michigan with Jim. And, and then I did a second story when, when he tried out, when he went to training camp with the Angels. And, and I did a story, another story with him there and we have become really good friends and it's amazing i mean he he didn't have the right hand but that's one of those things that he just got over so this is a short clip from the combination story when he was in college and with the angels he was a star quarterback in high school and an all-american pitcher at the university of michigan in 1987 he won the sullivan award as the nation's outstanding amateur athlete and in 1988, led the U.S. team to Olympic gold. Jim Abbott's fairy tale seems too good to be true, certainly too compelling for most reporters to ignore. I mean, those are things, you know, just you know, four or five things that, you know, are lifelong dreams. And, you know, when, that, when you go to bed at night, you, th you just thank your lucky stars of all the things that have happened. You don't say, I can't really see where missing five fingers is going to be an even trade-off for all that. Incredible story for yeah, sure. And what a good human being he is. Like he's one of, certainly one of the best human beings that I've ever met. And um, I'm, you know, proud to say he's a friend. And a lot of times I do stories on these people and they become friends. I'm not looking to make any more friends, but you treat them fairly. They, they appreciate, appreciate the fact you do. Like in all these stories with Abbott, I didn't try to make him to be this superhuman person. He just, um, he didn't, you know, it's that now what? What am I going to do? I don't have a right hand. I'll learn how to do this. He pitched a no hitter in, in, near the end of his career in Yankee Stadium. It's an amazing story. And the bonds between teammates can change and affect their lives forever. And you have a number of examples of this, but one that's really vivid and that you shared a few times before is the story of your relationship with your teammate, Jim Murphy. Yeah. Can you through that with, for us and, and tell us more about that and tell us about Jim. Jim was great. I, when I tried out for the, the freshman team, Jimmy's from Burrowville, Rhode Island. He's a tough kid, um, fight anybody. Um, and, you know, I, but I liked him a lot and I ended up being on his line. He, he was a center. Skip was the right wing. I was the left wing. We played the entire year together. And, and, you know, we back each other up and, you know, this and that. And so you really learn to trust somebody like that. And, Murph was having trouble academically and, and come on, Murph, come on, you know, and, and he had a girlf girlfriend issue, whatever. And he sort of went off the rails. And back then, if you didn't, if, if you flunked a course, you're eligible for the draft. So Murph did after, after the second semester of freshman year, off he went to Vietnam and um, we never heard from him again. And I, you know, the thing is, it happened a lot. He couldn't, there's no email or something. How do you, I don't know where he is. And um, he ended up surviving and he came back, but he, he, he was war damaged in a way. You know, he, he saw a lot of killing, a lot of stuff around him. 
miraculously, I think he had something like 70 people that rotated in and out of his, his little small like ambushing party. And only two people didn't get hit. Now Murph said his backpack got hit. He stepped on mines that were duds, all that kind of thing. But he came back, you know, with these nightmares and all the rest. He was, and Lou, Lou found him. Lou, like, I mean, talk about that. Murph goes, how did you find me? How'd you know I was back? And Lou had, did. Murph hadn't skated in years. Lou got him a scholarship. He got him back in, in school and, and Murph was having a tough time. But with help, he got back on the hockey team and he played and he, he ended, ended up being the captain his, his senior year, uh, became a school teacher and helped, you know, write a lot of lives um, through the years. He, I've all, and he's recently retired. And so I've reunited with Murph. We, he was in a, a, you know, one of our pub, public television stories about Providence. And we have become just really good friends. He's, he's, a, he's kind of a loner stay out in the woods and stuff like that. But we, we talk and call each other and say, I love you. And, and it's, I'm just so, you know, um, just happy that, that he's, he's alive, that we're friends and we're still teammates, really. I have to tell you an interesting story. I thought of this. I, I had a great, great hockey player teammate named Rich Pumple. Um, he, from, from Montreal suburb, the best player I'd ever played with and one of PC's great ever players. He broke his leg. Um, we had a good, a pretty good team our senior year. I think we were seventh in the country at one point early in the season. Pump broke his leg against New Hampshire on a Saturday night. We played Brown the next Tuesday before Christmas break. And our spirits were low because our best guy was gone. And Lou comes in the locker room and, and we're down three to one after the first period. And he, he starts really getting on us. You know, because we're, we're acting like, hey, we're keeping it close. And he said, that's not enough. He said, guess what? Rich Pumple is not coming back. I don't want to hear his name anymore because he's not coming back. I don't want any of these, these excuses. And we ended up winning that game. But in all these letters that I've written to Kathy through the years, through that year, I went back and we, we looked at him. I didn't mention his name once in those letters. And sorry, Pump, if you're listening, but I still love you. But I mean, I was, it was amazing because if anybody I could, you know, poor me to was my girlfriend, right? But Lou said, that's not what you want to do. And I played it that way. And I, I never did. And, you know, we ended up having a mediocre you know, 500 year could have been better. But I've never forgotten the fact that when these blows happen, you can't rewrite history, right? You've got to go on. And we would have been great with pump, but pump was gone and pump came back the next year and played pro hockey. And, I still stay in touch with him too. He's a wonderful human being. He is. I heard from him yesterday. He was hoping to join us tonight. Not Good. sure. Yeah, I hope he is right now or not. Yeah. But uh, he's he was excited about this uh, possibility. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about Lou Lamberlo and your relationship with him. Your coach and instructive of the kind of person he is, and his loyalty to his former players is a story from just recently about oh. a teammate of yours who right. hadn't heard from coach for a long, long time. Right. Tell us about that one. Well, my roommate, my roommate and line mate, Skip Sampson, the, he was on the line with Murph and me. And then Skippy became my roommate and was the captain of our team my senior year, went on and became a, a banker um, in Boston, moved to Florida, retired to Florida, his wife, Polly. And he, um, he's, he's been stricken with a really tough case of cancer um, and, and was in tough shape this year. So I went down to see him for a day and I saw Pump when I was down there too, who lives in Florida. And, um, and he, was, he was struggling. And so I, I got home and he, he hadn't talked to Lou in years. I, because of my job I, I, and because of maybe my personality, I, I kept in touch with Lou through the years. I never call him Lou, I always call him coach. And um, so I emailed him and I said, when I got home, it's coach, Skip is in tough shape. And I didn't know if, I mean, he's the GM of the Islanders now, he's busy. Well, right away, he comes back. He says, do you have contact information? So I sent it to him. And that was at night. And the next day, uh, Skip didn't know I did this. And the next day, um, I get a text from Skip saying, oh, my God, Lou Lamorello uh, called. He said, I remember he said, Polly is crying and I'm shaking. You know, and it's because he hadn't talked to him. And, and I think, too, when you're sick, 
you feel lonely. You're in Florida, you're, you know, you're stuck at home. You, he had a walker and all the rest. And, you know, he's, he, he had a, he had a, some surgery recently. I hope he's getting better, but that's Lou, right? He doesn't forget players. Um, he's a busy man, but uh, he, it's Tommy Sheehan, another deceased um, teammate of mine, Lou was always good with, with Tommy through the years. So let's keep uh, skipping our thoughts and our yes, prayers too these course, days. Yeah. That's important. Uh, thank you for letting us know about that and sharing the story. Those those bonds are sure strong, aren't they? They are strong, yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, it's Providence, right? Uh, to think about the name and the fact that I, my dad with the Dominican, the Navy, and I get Lou Amarello and I get Father Haas as the president. And I get all these friends that are still my friends, my roommates and my buddies. I hope a few are on here tonight. They're, um, we're, we're, it's a crazy time, you know, Vietnam, Kent State and all that stuff. But uh, there would, there's no other college that I, this would have, uh, that I, I wouldn't be talking to you tonight had I not gone to PC. Um, what I learned, I, I learned to speak. You know, I, I couldn't raise my hand. I wasn't capable of that. I was still struggling academically. I didn't know, uh, I, I was strengthened hockey wise because I could ended up playing against players who went in the NHL and I, I didn't start until I was 16. I was a hockey nobody, basically. Um, I just so appreciated it. And um, it, I, I ended up being the commencement speaker one year and that was crazy because like I said, I couldn't, I didn't raise my hand in class. And I didn't ever envision that until, you know, I got along the, on the way. And, you know, I think it's plunging in there. And, and once you go, well, what do I, there's a story, I think I talked to you, Joe, about reading about Springsteen when uh, he was just banging around at Asbury Park and trying to make it. And someone got a meeting with John Hammond, who was the, the best record producer who, who signed Bob Dylan. And Springsteen was supposed to go to his office and he didn't have a, a acoustic guitar and he was nervous. He borrowed a, a, a guitar, didn't have a case, rode the bus to this guy's office in New York. And then he said he got panicked. He said he was going to go up the stairs in the office. He goes, what am I doing? And he said to himself, he said, wait a minute, I'll go up there. And if he doesn't want me, I'll come down the stairs the same way I went up. I'm not going to lose anything. So Springsteen went up there and was relieved of that. And, and he sang, um, it's hard to be a saint in the city acoustically. And, and Hammond signed him on the spot. And so we all kind of sometimes think, well, a rejection is like an execution and it's not it's just keep going keep trying and you know there's a, a saying I, I remember hearing is that ships are safe in the harbor but that's not what ships are built for we're built to sail now we don't know how to sail so we're going to screw up take on water hit the rocks and do that you might even sink but if you trust and and you go out there you'll learn how to sail you'll learn how to read the currents and the winds and and pretty soon you'll be a, you'll be a captain of a, some big ship somewhere your own ship. A couple of minutes ago, you referenced the word providence and, and the, the special nature of the fact that the college is in this place that has this name and that it all fits together so well. And that was a the theme of The Promise of Providence, the documentary film that you and your uh, production partner, Mary Kay Wall, who is with us tonight, mm -hmm. uh, created for the college at the Centennial in 2017. I just put the link in the chat window. So if anybody hasn't seen it yet, please do take a look at it. It's spectacular work. Can you take us back to that 15 month period when you and Mary Kay and a couple of your sons and a few other people worked on, on creating that project and, and the labor of love that it was and how you feel about the way it came out? Well, it was, first of all, you called me Joe and asked if I'd be interested and what an honor that was. And, um, and Mary Kay has four kids, four or five kids uh, went to PC and one would have been graduating this year. And she's terrific and did, and was so glad to be on this project as well. But it, um, we tried to tell that story in, in a human way. You know, you could read, you could do a history and a chronological deal, but we decided to tell stories of overcoming, you know, adversity, the fire and the fire really hadn't been talked about publicly. And, um, Father Shanley, very, very moving way, talked about that and the resurrection that happened afterwards and, um, and the growth of the school and all the rest. And I, when we did it, I thought, well, 
one of the key things too is Father Peterson, Father John Peterson, who was really a, a lovely person and, and loved hockey and was a friend of Lou's and would always talk to me. And um, he was nearing the end of his life. And we interviewed him and he was in it and told some wonderful stories. And he was in a wheelchair and they didn't, oh, I don't know if I can make it. And, and he, we convinced him to go. And someone pushed him over there. And we saw him for breakfast the next day. And he said it was the happiest moment of his life. Um, and I think, too, when you see it, it's such a vindication of all the people who gave their life to that institution, that school. And, um, you know, all the people who were there, Father Shanley, you, and Molak, Manchester, Manchester Molak, um, and the coaches, and, you know, Nate, Ned, and it was just terrific. It was an honor to do it. Like I said, but it's a story, right? It's, it's not just a dry history. It's, a, it's what the province should be. The province is a story. Um, the school is a story. The people who, who go there and, and are proud of it are stories. And I think I want the story to keep be resonating around the country all the time. And it is. It's getting bigger and bigger. When I, when I moved back here, because um, when I went to Providence, there's hardly any Chicago kids there, right? So I moved back here with NBC, and I, I don't know, it was in the maybe 80s and 90s, and I once saw a car with a Providence bumper sticker. I waited by the car for 20 minutes for this person to show up. It's like, wow. But now there's a ton of people from, you know, with Providence bumper stickers in Chicago. In connection to the Dominican High School, Fenway. That's right, Fenway, so yeah. Of course, right. very strong. It has been uh, for for many years, but uh, we, I think we've told you many times, but once again, how much we appreciate you and Mary Kay and all the others who worked on on that project. It is something that will define the college's first hundred years for forever, really. To yeah, be, that's the cool part thing. of historic that record. Is part of that, yeah, mm -hmm. and and you go. Um, I, I wasn't qualified to come here until they qualified me, you know, and that's that's the story of life changing situations and it's you know people can say it all the time and and it sounds you know oh they changed me it truly did change change me i i mean that there was no other way there's no way i'd be had been at nbc i'd been doing any of these things had i not been schooled by so many people i have to tell you a funny story too is um I got, you know, back then we didn't have face masks. And so there are a few more fights in games. Now this is the sixties, late sixties. Maybe I should, I should tell the story. Um, so uh, I got in a really big fight uh, against Brown and against this really big player and a really good player who went up to be, went on to be an NHL fighter. And I did well in the fight. And I, like I always say, if I fought him a hundred times, he'd beat me a hundred times, but I, I had a good night that night. And so I was telling one of the current players a few years ago about, the fight and he said oh what kind of disciplinary action did the school take when you got back i said are you kidding me i have these letters writing it's like these priests i don't even know who they are they're stopping me on campus and they're hugging me you know because we beat brown for the first time in five years so it was a different time but it was kind of a, a moment of it wasn't a thuggish thing it was just a hockey thing and uh i just thought it was great because it was a it was a different era, you know, and I'm not condoning slugfests and stuff like that, but I think we beat we beat Brown for the first time in five years that night. So that was like a like exclamation point on it. <laughs> I hope you don't mind if we go a few minutes over, Mike. We've got no, a, a little know. bit more ground to cover no. and we appreciate everybody uh, staying with us. And I'm sure nobody wants this to end. We have a question uh, submitted mm -hmm. from one of the folks with us uh, this evening and that it's a good one. What role do you think faith plays in overcoming adversity, the kind of adversity that, that the world is facing right now? I think it's the whole thing. It's like I said, I mentioned before about having that home to get to, you know, when I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be creative. And I couldn't tell anybody because I had such a bad track record of, in school that they would have tried to say, no, you can't do that. Go away. You, you can't be creative. So I had to protect this thing inside myself. But it was a home. It was. I was sure I was going to be. Um, I was going to be creative somehow, and it was just not specific. It wasn't TV. It was just moving forward, buying a movie camera, and do the rest. Oh, I should tell you one story after that. And so, if I hadn't had that faith, 
and you can talk about faith in God and you can talk about faith in everything. And I think perhaps it's the same thing. Um, but I, I knew that, that there was a place for me, but I had to go through a lot of stuff to get there. Right. And a lot of stuff was knocked down, you know, you, you're, you're denied, you, you're, you're, you lose. We had losing seasons before Lou. Um, and you go, wow. How? And then trying to get into TV, so much rejection. But without faith, faith, I would have stopped in a second. And I didn't. Do you have another question? Because there's one last story I want to tell before I leave, too. I don't want to, you know. By all means, keep going. Well, you know, I, I've told the story many times, but I think it's, it's a faith question, too, is um, I got, I told you I bought a movie camera. When I went into my senior year, I started doing that stuff. Probably because I didn't know if I could write yet or whatever. So that movie camera got me into TV. But prior to buying the camera, uh, I decided to um, propose uh, to my wife-to-be after the summer of my junior year. I was living in a YMCA. Um, I forget, it was like 15 bucks a week or something like that. And I was working construction in Chicago, saving my money for an engagement ring because I wanted to get married before I probably shipped off to the war because I didn't know what was going to happen. So at the end of like there's no phones in the room. And at the end of the, my last day in construction, uh, I called home in Arizona where my parents were living. And I said, uh, I'm going to ask Kathy, to, I'm going to buy a ring tomorrow and ask Kathy to marry me on Sunday. And uh, my dad said, oh, that's great. Let me put your grandmother on who had been living with us since I was a little boy. And she goes, oh, that's great. I want to give you my mother's ring. And her mother was named Bridget O'Halloran, you know, from Ireland. And I said, oh, thank you. I, I didn't know she had a ring. You know, I'm, I'm a boy. And um, we had four boys in the family. And so my dad gets back on the phone. And I go, that's great, but I need the ring tomorrow. You know, and there's no Fed FedEx then. And he, he has faith. So he goes, I'll find a way. And uh, he said, be someplace where there's a phone tomorrow. So I, w I said, I'll be at Kathy's. And he calls me. And he, he had gone to the, he said, all right, go to O'Hare at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. A plane is coming in from Phoenix. And what he had done is he went to, the airport in Phoenix with this diamond ring wrapped in a handkerchief. And back then without security, you could go right to the departure gate. And he went to a departure gate for a plane to Chicago, found a flight attendant, said, could you bring this ring to my son? And one of them said, yes. And so my dad called me, he said, the flight comes in, it's whatever airline, I, I don't know her name, she's got brown hair. It's like, so you gave this ring to this stranger. So I go to the airport and I'm there and I'm, like I say, just blue jeans and a t-shirt and flight empties out and I'm on the arrival gate by myself and these flight attendants are looking at me and they come up to me and one comes up to me and she said you must be the boy I said I am she takes this ring out of her little side pocket there and gives it to me and gives me a hug it says have a wonderful life and she walks away I'm going wow the ring crossed the the ocean you know um, someone believing and hoping to have a better life went across the country on a, in the hands of a trusted stranger to me and I thought, well, now I have eight hundred, I have a thousand dollars that I saved for the ring. So I went out and I bought a movie camera with that money that I wouldn't have had, and the movie camera got me my job. But what really got me the job was the ring and my dad's trust in the stranger, his faith, right? And so I always think about that because I go, you need a little bit of luck, you need a little bit of something, but you also have to be ready to use that 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 blessing or that gift. And I've told this story so many times. But I think it's important because it, I don't want to take credit for, oh, I was so tough and I could do this on my own. I needed that gift to buy a movie camera. And I didn't even know, I never thought of buying a movie camera before that, but I did. And the, and the movie camera got me the job. It's not overcoming adversity, but it has some of the same characteristics of those stories, doesn't it? People helping yeah. other people and yeah. having faith and, and knowing that things will, will work out. Hoping, yeah, hoping and trusting and, and, and knowing, like I said, I knew it had to work out for me. It had to work out. And so I had to be ready when, when, you know, when Richard Salant found me, I had to be ready. And when, you know, the guy at the PBS station said, they give you a cameraman, I easily could have said, I don't, I don't know how to do a story. But, but I was ready because I'd been taking movies and I'd been looking at things and I wrote all those letters. So I was, I was telling stories but it all came together at the time that it should come together. We have a couple of questions from folks sure. in the audience. Mike, uh, Michael 
asking if you saved any of the eight millimeter movies you took. Oh, yeah. PC student. You still have them? I have them. Yeah. In fact, I was just the other day. Um, I have some of them digitized, but I have to get them all done. And that's, I was just talking about it two days ago. So I do have that. I don't have some of the early TV stuff I have, but I have all that. And um, it's a lot of it's just goofy, you know, because I was learning to shoot and we're kind of imitating, you know, Hard Day's Night and Help and doing all this, that stupid stuff. But uh, some, of the, some of it isn't. Some of it's just cool shots. I have a game, you know, one, some, some shots of uh, one, of the, one of my games my senior year, which wouldn't have existed without that. So, yeah, I do. That might be some of the oldest actual Friar hockey footage. I, I bet it is because I had to buy special – and, you know, I didn't have any money. I had all these jobs on campus, too. I was, I was playing hockey, and I was a grounds crew of the baseball team. I worked in the cafeteria. I parked cars at the Biltmore at night, so did Pump. And, uh, and so, we, we, you know, we all had to kind of do that back then. It was a different age. I don't think people are, I don't think athletes are allowed to do that anymore to, to work, but we did work. And I, so I'd be, I'd, I'd be in a hockey game on like Wednesday night and I'd get a black eye or stitches across the forehead and they, people would go through the line of the cafeteria and go, Hey Mike, what happened to your head? You know, and I'd be serving coffee the next morning at 6 a.m. or whatever it was. Chuck Barkowski, somebody who's oh, certainly a year, year behind you at PC, yeah. uh, asking a, a great question. Do you have another book in you? I do. It, Chuck, thank you for listening. He's a great guy. Um, I do. I, I, I thought of that, but, it, you know, it's time. And I, I have all, so many other things that, that we want to do. But I've often thought about that because, like, the book I did with my parents was about life and all the rest. But I'm older. I've seen more stuff play out. I think the country is so divided now that in common thing, you know, brand that we did for, for public television and, and my today show situations really proved to me that throw the politics away. I have got friends in the reddest of States and the bluest of States because we never talk about it. We just, we just bonded at an earlier stage and it's getting harder and harder to do that. And I think we have to be really careful. So one, you know, perhaps without, um, you know, without a lecturing type of book, but a book of experience. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I've learned along the way. And, and, and I know it's legit stuff because I know it works. Well, there are a few hundred people here, a couple hundred people here tonight who would be lining up to buy it. So <laughs> you, you, you're off to a good start if you do take that direction. In Common is fantastic, by the way. I encourage people to Google it and, and watch some of the segments. It's really, really great. Mary Kay Wall also working with you on that. My favorite segment in that series is about creativity. Oh, and yeah. one of the people you profile is John Prine, somebody yeah. who you became very close to and who I sadly did. recently recently died uh, from COVID-19. Tell us a little more about that relationship and about him. Well, it started in Phoenix when Kathy and I, you know, I was working those lousy jobs and I still had a dream, but, but we were making no money. And so at night we put the kids to bed and I would sit by the record player. We just play records or songs, specific songs from albums. And we played John Prine a lot because he seemed to be singing about us. His 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 whole creativity in music mostly was about everyday life. So um, I always thought about that. I thought and I, I wondered, boy, he sounds he's funny, he's smart, he's sentimental. And so when I got a job at NBC, um, maybe that was like 1986. I thought I can do anything. I'd like to do a story on Prine. So I contact with him and he called me back and I went to Nashville. He picked me up at the airport and we drove around and we spent two or three days there and was at his kitchen table and he was singing songs with his friends at night. And it was really cool. And I love the story. It did. It, and it helped him because at the time he wasn't getting much uh, big, you know, big time coverage. So then I ended up doing another story about five or six years later uh, with him and then staying in touch. I got, became friendly with his manager and then, um, we did the piece for In Common. And, and we wanted to do a, a story on creativity. We thought of John Prime because a lot of times people think creativity is wild. And I always think, you know, they say, think outside the box. And I think it's always think inside the box. You know, go deeper. What is this about? And that's entirely what John Prime does, is thinks in, he thinks inside the box. He looks at everyday life and sees something deeper. And so we picked him as the main person in the story about creativity. And he had a you know rough go. He cancer and a bunch of stuff had knocked his his jaw in and all this stuff. But he kept going, and he died of the COVID. And 
um, this, this past summer, he was at Ravinia, the outdoor place where I saw Bob Dylan. And I couldn't go because my wife was sick that night. And I was sitting on the porch and all of a sudden I got all these texts, you know, coming in saying, John Prine just dedicated a song to you. I go, really? And he did. And I, I found it on, on um, it was Grandpa Was a Carpenter and it's on uh, YouTube. And at the beginning of it, it's from Ravinia. He goes, uh, this goes out to Mike Leonard and his family. I know he's here, you know, like, or something like that. And that, you know, he, less than a year later, he's gone. And so I wouldn't say, you know, I, I'm not the type of person who would bother somebody like that and call him up. But he appreciated what I do, what I did. I so appreciated what he did. And his music has been part of my life and the life of my children. And I've also turned a lot of my children, who are now all adults, onto Prine, who is truly one of America's greatest songwriters. Maywood, May, he was a mailman in Maywood, Illinois. Or he was a, he's Maywood. from Maywood. He's from Maywood, but he's a mailman in a nearby suburb and you know, wrote some of the first songs as a mailman. Now, the stories are, are great. There are a few of them, and, and right. really worth watching, whether you're a fan of John Priner or just like to learn about him. This is a, a good way to, to do that. A question from uh, Bill, Mike. What advice would you provide to those who need to perform at, the, at their best when the pressure is really on them? Um, it's hard to do, but you have to relax. It's, I, I used to box, as I mentioned earlier. And I, when I first started, I, I didn't start until I was in my 40s. And I, there was only one gym to go. It wasn't like now where you can go into these sort of training, you know, stuff where men and women are playing. I had to go to a, a real gym and, and a real bunch of rough characters there. And um, I remember the first time I'd been in a couple of scrapes, hockey scrapes, but it's not, but when you put the gloves on and all the rest, it's a different deal. And I remember when I got blasted for the first time, there was a sense of, Oh my God, where am I? And, and, and a little bit of panic sets in because it hurts and your, your, your bell is wrong. But I real, you learn really quickly because if I, if I get scattered, I'm going to get hit 15 more times. And so you have to really shut it down right away. Like, boom, that hurt, but what am I going to do now? And you have to be calm and you can't be angry because if you're angry, you take wild swings and you get whacked again. So my whole thing is try to, when, when things happen, is I go, wow, that, that wasn't very good. Now what are we going to do about it? But you really have to take a deep breath and you really have to be calm. But some people were saying too, in this, in this situation here, um, you know, those folks who are lucky enough to keep their jobs or whatever, they still feel battered in some way. And I, and I, somebody asked me the other day, what, what do you think? I said, you should just give, give to somebody because that always feels better, you know, and go to your grocery store and, you know, write a check and give it to the manager and say, give this to the bag boys. Don't tell them who he's from, you know, because they have to take buses and trains and stuff to get there. And so um, th that part of, of having faith, trying to calm down, you know, in boxing, you have to see the whole thing. If you look at the hands, you think you have to look at the hands because that's what's going to hit you, but you can't because they're going to fake. You got to look at the whole thing. You can see a movement and you know it's coming, but you have to be calm to do that. And uh, it seems opposite. You know, people think it's anger and it's, it's absolutely not that. So I would say to give and, 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 to, and, to, and to breathe basically and, and trust. Don asks where you draw inspiration from when you're facing adversity. That's really good. I think from all the, like from my dad, you know, my dad, when he was not even nine, his parents who are from Ireland had lost two siblings. He lost two siblings and they sent him to Ireland on a boat when he was nine. And his mother was probably having a tough time after losing two siblings. My dad was there for five, almost six years. Now, now, he never complained about it. He came back to America, and he told me, and he didn't really talk much about it. He said, oh, that, that it was a great in Ireland, and, and I love my parents and stuff. But how many people who, not even nine, go from electricity and running water to not that, to another country with a bunch of strangers and live? He came back, and he got off of the boat like a few days before school started. He hadn't been in school for six years. So he goes to high school. He's got an Irish accent now, and and, he, and it's like, what happened? But you would think that that guy would have, you know, said, well, you know, I have this problem because I felt abandoned, you know, and he could have, but he didn't. So I think I, those things, the people who've gone before us, 
my dad was, when I went on the ride of our lives, the, the RV trip with my parents, something struck me. Um, I, my parents were in the back bedroom of this RV and there's a door and there's curtains and I slept on the fold out couch. And the first night, my dad was 80, forget at the time, 87, I think. My mom was 82. And I, the curtain was kind of open when they're getting ready for bed, ready for bed. And I looked and my dad was on his knees saying his prayers before he went to bed. And I'd never seen that because I'm not in his bedroom when he goes to sleep. And it struck me, the guy's 87. He has no money. He's, he's had a, some setbacks. And he's thanking God for all of his blessings. And I thought, wow. And it really, it really affected me. So that and, you know, like, again, a lot of the people I've done stories on who suffered and came back. I've had a lot of examples in my life of people who live up to. I don't live up to them, but I try. Well, that answers the question about where you get your resiliency, your, <laughs> your faith and your perspective. And speaking yeah. of perspective, one more clip. Uh, yep. from a story about Mark Stefan. Stefan. Stefan, I'm sorry. And the right. thing that strikes me about this story is the capacity for people to find perspective, even though they've really faced some, some tough situations and, and have had a, a lot to overcome. Tell us a little bit about this clip. Yes. Mark Stefan is a guy I know. He lives in, in the neighborhood and he was a great athlete. He had uh, 15 or 17 marathons, triathlons, all this kind of stuff. He was on a bike ride one Sunday and the front wheel came off and he went down and he shattered his neck and he quadriplegic done you know basically you'll never walk again that's it and uh, mark decided to walk and took all these experimental treatments painful things and he learned to walk very slowly with these with these crutches but he walked and he walks every day and i'd see him and he smiles and he decided to take a bike ride um, to raise funds for the rehabilitation center that helped him and and that, those things happen a lot those kind of stories that you know, you know run across america and stuff like that but Mark's case was so amazing that I decided to um, do a Today Show piece on it. And um, so he, he, he took this bike ride from California to Florida, sometimes with just one or two people. Sometimes some of his friends would join him. So this is a clip from that, that piece. And man, he is so inspiring. 53-year-old Mark Steffen, a suburban Chicago resident and married father of four, is a quadriplegic after fracturing his spinal cord in a bicycle accident almost five years ago. He wasn't supposed to walk, let alone ride again. A few years ago, I chronicled his ascent to the top of Chicago's Willis Tower. And now, this bicycle odyssey, through the challenges, the setbacks, and the constant reminders of how life used to be. But I see you're smiling. Oh yeah, I mean, Mike, considering where I came from, look at this, I'm out on a bike ride on a you know, Tuesday afternoon with a bunch of my buddies. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's not all bad. Well, the, the three people you've uh, shared stories about with us tonight, all remarkable and inspiring, uh, as are you. So we really appreciate this. You've, you, you've given us an awful lot of time, Mike, and we're, we're so thankful for that. Just one more thing, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. The class of 2020 would have been graduating on yeah. Sunday at the Dunkin' Donuts Center, setting you know well from your children having graduated there and you having given the commencement address 20 years ago. Did very tough situation, very disappointing. Yeah. Well, there's another time when a Providence College class didn't have a normal graduation, and that was your class. That's right. That's right. right. 70. So the parallels here are, are interesting, very different situations, but yeah. would you share with our seniors and others who are about to graduate from PC this weekend and and what insights do you have about this situation? Well, uh, it is sad. I mean, you want to celebrate it and all the rest, but it is a celebration, you know, and and I think you can celebrate it perhaps better by um, you know, celebrating it every day and and spreading the word and and being as good as you can be and um, I, I had talked about earlier when I want, I told the people at NBC, I don't want to, don't tell me, uh, don't praise me too much. And I know they deserve praise, but, you know, and so when you don't get it, you feel that you got robbed from some, uh, of something. But I think that's the time when, you know, that's your own adversity to say, 
yeah, we did, but now what are we going to do? You know, maybe the best way to, for me to, to um, maybe the best commencement speech that I can hear is one I can give, you know, to other people and encourage other people and say, yeah, we didn't get it, but um, we'll, we, we'll get something, you know, and we'll get something by being good, good people. Like, you know, that, Johnny Cougar or whatever his name was, the dad my dad met. You know, he he I'm sure you know celebrations and graduations weren't that big of a deal. Everything's gotten so big now. But I think um, you know, you know, it's it's sad, but you you can't feel sorry for yourself because there are way sadder things than being denied a celebration. You know, there are people who denied the opportunity to celebrate, uh, you know, to to get a college education. You got a great one and you're a PC graduate. And I think it's it's your gift is your is giving to other people and and doing that and after a while you, I don't think you need it anymore you know I think I think you live it then. It's adversity to overcome, right? That's adversity to come and go full circle. <laughs> it is How about my hair, Joe? Look at my hair. I looks like I'm a cross between Gene Wilder and and Harpo Marx right now. <laughs> It's kind of crazy, isn't it? I never thought mine was getting back to 1977 again, but here we are. You're getting Neil Youngish on me. That's okay. Well, <laughs> maybe. Um, so, um, it's the context, of course, in 1970 was the aftermath of Kent State. Yeah, yeah. And Mike's tremendously accomplished classmate, Roy Peter Clark, America's mm -hmm. writing coach, also class of 1970, yeah. wrote an essay to the current seniors. And I just put the link in the chat. Great essay, too. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Roy was with us a little bit earlier today. I noticed. I think that he uh, had to leave, but uh, it was nice to that's good. Yeah, see his name good across guy. the top here uh, yeah. as well. So uh, well worth reading, and uh, I know that our seniors and their parents appreciated that. Incidentally, the college's plan is to celebrate an actual commencement with the class of 2020 on October 31st at oh, the Halloween Duncan Donuts <laughs> Center. Halloween, so a Saturday night, and uh, that should be that should be good. By the way, we. Uh, if you'd like to say hello to, to Pump again, Mike, he is, he is here now, so. Richard, the best, I mean, <laughs> That's good. I remember the first time you showed up and I thought, oh God, we're gonna be great now. Why'd you break your leg? <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn it, that's the way that goes. A couple of people to thank, Chris Judge, class of 2005, uh, our, our tremendous multimedia, the best, yeah. all, all these clips, showed the photos, made this whole thing work, and Sarah Ferretto, class of 2003 from the uh, Providence College Alumni Relations team, Bob Ferreira, the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations, all helping to make this work. This is always fun for me, if you'll indulge me for just a second. I've told Mike this story a couple of times before. After I left PC in 1983, went to graduate school and became a television news reporter in Maine and became an admirer of the Mike Leonard's work, having no idea that Mike had gone to Providence <laughs> College or that I would ever meet him, much less get a chance to work with him. We used to ask the or another reporter and I used to ask the master control operator on our way out the door, record the Today Show, please, in case there's a Mike Leonard story so that we could watch it. But to, there are some clunkers in there, Joe. <laughs> oh, I didn't see any. But to have a chance to uh, work with and, and meet and become friends with a professional. I love it. I, I, it's all, so it's I love when I go back to PC and sit coming into your office and sitting around just chatting about stuff. It's the best. It's good. And uh, we're glad to be able to share these talks, uh, this talk tonight with this audience and hopefully we can do it again sometime before very long mike really yeah, appreciate your time yeah. thank you joe for doing it thanks chris too thanks mike and thank you all have a good night go right. friars good night bye-bye